Hey everybody, are you guys able to hear me? Okay, great. We're gonna go ahead and get started with uh, some course logistics stuff. So this is kind of our calendar. Um, we are here today and we just have one class left. Um, so today we'll talk about robots and making and then next time we'll talk about AR VR and kind of a summary and critiques of HCI in general. Um, all of your assignments, with the exception of uh, the last test, have been posted to Canvas. Um, so all of those are due um, on the 16th, and I've went ahead and made the exam due um, on the 20th uh, by midnight, along with your project being due. Um, only one more class. Yes, one more class. But this. This one's going to be good, so it's a good thing you showed up today. Um, so we're going to do, um, you'll have all of these assignments that you have remaining and this last quiz, last reflection, um, all of that's due on Monday, um, the 16th. And then the last exam and the projects will be due um, on November 20th on a Friday. That's our final day. We won't be meeting for a final or anything. Um, I've posted. Um, all of the details about your projects um, on Canvas. Uh, so please take a look at that. And I've also given you feedback if you submitted for that last assignment. Let me see, it looks like there's a question. Uh, how hard would I rate the last exam? It will be much easier than the others. It will be the easiest exam. Um, I am actively deleting questions for you right now. Um, and I, I didn't post it earlier because I'm swapping out some questions um, that have some robot stuff in them. Um, but yes, I will say it would be the easiest of all of them. Um, and if nothing else, um, if you didn't even look at the exam until our final period, you could definitely get it done during that time if that's what you wanted to do. Um, so yeah, don't worry about that too much. Um, focus on your projects. That's the main thing. Um, I've posted the details of everything that you'll need to submit um, for the final project checkpoint. Um, and anybody, uh, there were a few, a handful of you who didn't, hadn't yet submitted for the, um, the checkpoint for revision two. Um, I'm going to go back through and look today and see if anybody submitted since then. Um, please do that um, as soon as possible so I can give you feedback so that you know if everything's on track or not um, for your project. Um, but if you have any questions apart from that, send me an email, let me know, and I will get back to you on that. OK. Oh, OK, yeah, uh, I forgot about this. But um, course evaluations are available now. Um, they're all online. I think it's, it's called Class Climate. It's a little tab in Canvas. Um, please fill out the course evaluation for the class. It um, helps me know what topics worked, what was good, what was bad about the class, and improve it for the next semester. So um, I saw, I think, one person had already filled it out. But um, I'll remind you again next class. But try to get that filled out this week. All right. So last time, um, we talked about designing for non-traditional uh, interfaces. Um, specifically, we focused a lot on voice agents. And today, we're going to talk about robots and making things. Um, so we're in a little bit um, of a different setup today. Um, so uh, I have someone here helping me. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, my wife, Kenna. Uh, we, work, we both work in the STARS Robotics Lab. And we have a lot of robots to show you um, today. Um, so Hopefully you will enjoy it. Um, but we're going to start off um, by talking about uh, just making things in general, um, not robots specifically. Um, but just kind of, we, we talked about this a little bit last time. Um, and talked about creating things. So like we have these Internet of Things. Um, and the idea that as things become cheaper and more accessible, um, you know, a 3D printer, it's a couple hundred dollars today. Um, you have access to a lot of easy off-the-shelf components. Um, so you can build things that are small electronics, physical things that also have software and usually are connected um, to the internet. So 
Uh, we'll continue talking about that today. Um, we talked a little bit about basic electronics last time, um, s talking about um, specifically um, sensors and actuators. Um, so here's just a, an arrangement of sensors that um, we use in our lab on the Therabot robot. Um, so some of these sensors, um, you know, they do different things, like um, these are um, temperature sensors, um, these are capacitive touch sensors. Um, some of them sense light, um, the color of light, the brightness. Um, others have uh, IMUs in them so they can sense the orientation and acceleration, um, just like in a, a smartphone. Um, but there are a wide variety of sensors um, available that you know, anybody can just purchase um, online and, and easily interface with them writing a little bit of code um, and, and start to use them as part of a bigger system. Um, similar to sensors, we talked about um, actuators. So these are some of the actuators that um, are kind of a favorite in robotics. Um, these are little smart actuators. Um, so I've got some of them, and I've shown you these before. Um, so here's one of them um, that's attached to a, this is a testing rig, so it's got a spring on it um, to test. But the actuator itself um, is more little block like this. Um, and it's actually uh, kind of got a full system in it. So it's got a little microcontroller in it, it's got a motor, it's got gears in it, it can, you can give it kind of intelligent high-level commands um, and it will take care of things and talk back to you. Um, and you know, it, it plugs into power supply and um, either a serial port or USB, um, so you can talk to it from a variety of, of programming languages. Um, when we think about actuators in general, uh, so this is inside of a, like a typical servo motor. Um, so what you typically have is um, down in the bottom part, um, you have an actual motor, and then you have a bunch of gearing. Um, and so gearing gives a, a trade-off on the motor between speed and torque. Um, so for some applications, um, you don't really need a lot of force, you just want to spin very quickly. Uh, and for others, you need a lot of uh, torque or force to overcome something. Um, and so that's always a trade-off as you design these things. And so when you look at different actuators, um, typically you'll find the specifications are in terms of the maximum speed and maximum torque. Um, I should say that motors are not the only um, actuator that exists. So when we think about actuators, we think about them kind of as outputs um, in the world, um, whether that's, you know, uh, sound or light or movement. Um, so these are uh, an example. These are some LED panels. Um, so you also have probably commonly seen, you know, LED strips. Um, you can buy these usually, um, and they usually have some little interface like a remote control to change the color of them. These are a little bit different. So these are what you would buy if you're wanting to program them. Um, so each little LED has a red, green, and blue light in it, um, sometimes also a white light. Um, and it's got a data line. And so you can individually address each of these as a pixel. Um, so if you've seen large video walls, um, like usually at concerts or something, it's really just a ton of LEDs, uh, each one being a pixel, making up a giant screen. So that's uh, them in, in that format. And then the format that's on the slide there um, is just the kind of little grid um, form factor. So it's a bunch of them just in a grid. And then you can put your connectors on it and you can you know, connect them in series and have a bunch of them um, if you like. So I've talked about um, sensors and actuators, and that's all great, but uh, how do you actually use these things, talk to these things, you know, how do you integrate them into a product or a design? Um, typically, typically, we start with a low-level um, way of controlling them. So this is a microcontroller. The one on the screen is a, a Teensy microcontroller. Um, and 
you might have seen others uh, like an Arduino. Um, there are a lot of popular microcontrollers you can buy today. And the idea of a microcontroller is typically you write lower level code um, and you can do things like um, you've got all these pins down the side of it. Um, you can do things like turn them on or off. Um, you can run them at a certain frequency um, and you can send data um, over different protocols to different devices. So a lot of sensors, for example, um, they speak over a I2C protocol or a SPI protocol. Um, and a lot of that's all built into these microcontrollers for you. Um, and so you can start to connect all of these inputs and outputs to these microcontrollers, um, write some code for it, and then usually you'll have that code um, it might send data out. Um, so some microcontrollers even have like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth built into them. Um, others just USB or serial lines um, to connect to a computer where you would then process the data further. Um, so that's kind of the workhorse that you would find in a lot of robots and in a lot of just appliances and kind of like smart objects that we see today are these low level microcontrollers. Um, and they're usually pretty cheap. Um, so we're, we're talking like, you know, 10 to $20 for these development versions of different microcontrollers. And then when you would scale up to mass produce, we're very cheap, um, like dollars um, or less, uh, depending on, on what you're doing. So if you're interested in making things, um, microcontrollers and just learning kind of the basics of, of using them is a, a great place to start. Um, but today we have something even better. Um, we have single board computers. And so you've probably heard of a Raspberry Pi before. Um, there are a lot of single board computers that exist in the world now. And what a single board computer does is kind of brings you the, the best of both worlds. Um, you have a microcontroller built in and you have um, a full computer, um, as we would traditionally think of it, usually running like Linux or something, um, running on the same system. So now you can just directly, you know, from your, your code that's running on this Linux system, um, do the functionalities that are uh, associated with microcontrollers. Um, you can do those uh, straight all in one contained system. So here I've just shown a few examples of different single board computers. Um, there are a ton of them out there. And they're quite affordable. I think the Raspberry Pi Zero, um, which is this little guy, it's very tiny. Um, and you see it's got an HDMI output on it and USB. Um, these are uh, like $5 or something um, to get one of these. And it's a basic little Linux system and microcontroller all in one. Um, so this is this is also a good place to start. Um, so you can actually you know hook this up and have like a Linux desktop on it um, if you want to do that as well. Um, and so these are kind of also workhorses of robotics or smart things, um, and especially to prototype. Um, here's another one that I should point out. So this is a an ESP um, thirty two which is a very popular little um, Wi-Fi microcontroller board. Um, this is in so many smart things. Um, if you were to like tear apart your smart light bulbs, uh, you'd probably find one of these inside of it. So um, very affordable and, and very useful. So the point being that there's just a ton of these things out there um, and a ton of resources for using them. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about um, fabrication. So that's kind of the electronic side of things. And um, you know, I would definitely encourage you, if you're interested in electronics um, and you know, don't have any background, um, I've got some resources linked here to Adafruit and SparkFun. Um, I would recommend just looking at some of the beginner tutorials. Um, they're great. They've got full like YouTube videos and community support and all kinds of things. Um, you could certainly take a class here um, or at any university, um, usually like a, it will be in the electrical department or computer engineering um, where you learn about microcontrollers and all these things on it. And you kind of look at more uh, formal side of that as well as the practical side. Um, but the practical side is, is really what you need to build things. Um, and that kind of information and data is, is available. Um, 
kind of just out there. So I do want to talk about fabrication a little bit. And I know it's this is a computer science course, um, but it's kind of important. Um, we've talked about designing things um, and not just software interfaces. And more and more, um, we see things designed that have some physical attribute to them. So I mentioned some of these uh, different methods for fabricating things. Um, I just kind of want to walk through them. So there's just traditional approaches which work really well. And so this is something as simple as, you know, um, measuring things, cutting things with tools, um, going to a craft store, going to a hardware store, um, buying the materials that you need, and, and kind of just taking a, a craft perspective on it, um, learning to manipulate these things. Um, and this is certainly useful. Um, these are some examples for the um, tail design of one of the early prototypes of the Therabot robot. Um, and so this is just showing a process of um, needing to make these little discs um, over and over. And so um, you know, manually measuring that out, marking that, um, and then using a drill press to drill where you need to. Um, here's a prototype of that tail. Uh, design which uses a cable pull system and you can see that it's definitely a prototype right you've got these giant screws in it um, you know um, it's being held by a vice um, but uh, you don't have to have uh, a laser cutter or a 3d printer or any fancy machinery really um, to fabricate some of these basic prototypes right um, and it's you know it's a lot more um, work and you know your skill level will determine how repeatable you know making this block is um, if you look in this photo my skill level is not very good at doing that um, but it's good enough for this prototype so from there I want to move straight to just 3d printing because um, 3d printing is super affordable now um, so you can buy a decent 3d printer on Amazon you know for a couple hundred dollars um, and so it, one of the like the workhorse 3D printers that we use constantly in our lab um, is about $1,200 assembled, um, and it's you know it does a lot, um, and we use it constantly. Um, but these things are becoming affordable, um, and again, the tools to make and design your parts and uh, to go through that process are widely available and mostly um, free. Um, so I wanted to point out some different uh, design software that you can use to make 3D parts. Um, so the software that we use most commonly in our lab, and we've tried a lot of different things, um, is Autodesk Fusion 360, which is, uh, has a pretty good license for educational use and um, for non-commercial use, just for hobbyist use. Um, and so this is a full 3D environment um, that allows you to you know, create whatever part you need. So this is a part of a Therabot robot um, in Fusion 360. Um, you can make adjustments, measure things. It's got version control. You can collaborate. All of those things um, in this software. Export the 3D files, um, and then just a step or two later, have it printing on your printer. Um, some other options, um, SolidWorks is also professional level software that's commonly used. Um, it's, it's similar to Fusion 360. Um, then you have some things like Tinkercad. Um, so that's something that's just a web-based um, platform that anyone can use for free. There are several of those um, to get you started uh, 3D printing and making parts. And they really allow you to do a lot. Um, and the great thing is that they're free um, and available. So I want to talk a little bit about why 3D printing um, is so important. And I'll just give you a few examples of when 3D printing is useful. Um, so if you ever you know, needed like C or D batteries and all you had were double A's, um, you could just print this nice little piece of plastic um, that you can find um, on uh, thingiverse.com, which has a ton of um, stuff that people have made um, that you can just download and run through off on your printer. And you can make your batteries fit in the, the place that they're not supposed to fit. Um, similarly, if you need a large wrench um, to you know um, turn something that's 
out there that you don't have a, a wrench that fits quite perfectly, uh, you can actually print something strong enough uh, that will allow you to use it for a little while at least um, to get a job done when you don't have a tool that you might need. Um, also, you can make nice little things to organize stuff. So we print a ton of stuff just to keep things organized. Um, obviously, when you build stuff, um, you have lots of tiny little parts everywhere. Um, so here's like just some drawers. Um, here's like a little desk organizer. You can put pens and pencils in it. Um, it's you know always good to have um, the printer running and, and making you nice things. Uh, what kind of materials do 3D printers use? That's a great question. Um, so I happen to have some of those materials here. So uh, what the 3D printer will use is um, a filament. So this is a roll of filament here. Um, this is a um, PLA plastic. So there's two main types of plastic that printers use. Uh, one is PLA and the other is ABS. ABS plastic is you find in a lot of um, like toys, like Legos are made out of ABS plastic. Um, it has some very nice properties, it's very durable, um, holds up well in the heat. Uh, PLA plastic is not as durable um, in terms of like heat resistance, um, but it is a lot easier to print with. Um, so you can see it's kind of just like, you know, just this strand of plastic on this spool. Um, and you feed that into the printer and it will layer by layer create your part. Now there are also um, some specialty, you know, those are the two basic materials, but there are a lot more materials out there. So this is a material um, called Ninja Flex um, and it's a flexible filament. So you can actually print things that are flexible, um, kind of rubber-like. Um, and there are different levels of um, flexibility. Um, so there are, there are a ton of types of um, material that you can print with and, and most printers support a wide range of them um, and you can it depends on what you want you know what, what properties you're looking for um, so we print a lot of things in ABS plastic because um, we want them to be very durable and to hold up in the heat um, and that requires you know watching the printers a little bit more carefully tuning things better um, and kind of uh, mastering that process. Um, but if we're printing just quick prototypes or something, PLA plastic is very forgiving. Um, it's very quick to print. Um, so that's, that's also a choice. And I should say that they constantly, you know, create new materials. Um, so um, other reasons to 3D print. So maybe you just want to decorate, um, you know. So here's a, a nice vase. Um, here's a little Christmas tree. Um, that we printed on the printer there. Um, you can find all kinds of cool little, you know, decorative things or little functional things. Um, like I said, on the website Thingiverse is kind of the biggest one, um, but there are plenty of websites out there um, where people share things that they've created. Um, and so it kind of opens up um, the, you know, opens you up to be able to quickly create things um, that are usable in addition to customizing things uh, for your own use. Um, so here's a big reason for why to 3D print. Um, so here's an example. Um, this is from Therabot project. Um, so you can see um, we've got some motors here. Um, this is the motors that um, we used like five years ago. Um, these are a new model of motor that came out um, within the past couple of years. And this was a motor that was coming out but wasn't yet available for purchase but we could download the 3d model of it and so we could print it um, and actually be able to have you know something that is exactly what the part will look like um, and to work with it in our current robot um, to see how things would fit um, and then once we have the actual part um, it's pretty much a exact uh, drop-in. Um, it's also great for printing, you know, for creating things like brackets or whatever to hold these parts together um, because you have everything exactly there. So another reason to 3D print, to make things for your printer. Um, so you can, a lot of the parts of the actual printer, if you see like this orange part here, they are 3D printed themselves. So printing another printer is a good plan. Um, but in this case, um, we printed this little 
arm to hold this little camera um, so that you can you can watch your long running prints. Um, you know, if, you, if something's going to take 20 hours to print and you don't want to sit there um, and watch it, um, but you want to check in every now and then, just got this little camera on here and it makes cool time lapses too. Um, so you can see how how this is um, useful. Um, so now we kind of go to the question of is 3D printing easy? Um, yes and no. Um, so you uh, definitely have to learn a little bit um, to, to start 3D printing. I should say there are a lot of things out of the box that you can use um, and work, but you'll definitely run into your share of problems. Um, so I'd like to show you some of those problems now. These are some of the things that have happened to me. Um, this is also maybe an argument for not leaving your printer running when you're not there. But you live and learn. Um, so you know, you can see where um, it's kind of just spewed out all of the filament there. Um, another example of a failed print. And you can see this isn't, um, you know, this isn't necessarily a good thing because that was like 12 hours into this it failed. So if you're on a deadline or something, you know, probably want to be a little bit careful with the printer. Um, here's some more art from the printer. Um, a lot of a lot of these are, are based in, you know, um, the first layer of, of this plastic when it goes down, if it doesn't stick correctly or if something shifts or if something, you know, some airflow blows through the room and something, uh, you know, messes with the, the nozzle of the printer and then it gets offset, you, you end up with things like this. Um, but in general, um, you, can, you can recover. So here's a particularly horrible thing the printer did. Um, and here it is, all nice and cleaned up and ready to do it again. Um, so, and um, I should say, you know, you can print extra parts for your printer um, in case you break some parts of it while you're using it. So here are some resources um, that I, I had in here last time. Um, these are great resources for electronics and um, even for 3D printing and some basic fabrication stuff. Um, so Adafruit and SparkFun, these are both companies um, that do a lot of um, creating of like electronics for people to develop and, and make things, um, whether you're a hobbyist or uh, developing an actual product. Um, but they also have a great deal of um, resources in terms of like uh, guides that teach you how to do all of these things, show you examples of using the projects, um, lots of software. Um, so it's really easy to get started on this. Um, and they, they also they sell a lot of these sensors and actuators and things um, in a pretty usable form. Um, and, and their prices are reasonable. Um, I should say you can also buy you know, uh, these kinds of things on Amazon um, or something like that um, as well. So that kind of sums up um, everything I want to talk about in terms of making. Um, but now I want to talk about robots specifically. Um, so I just will show you some robots um, that were just kind of in my camera roll um, that I've seen different places. Uh, so this, this robot, this is a robot that's like supposed to be like a little baby. Um, and when I saw it at this conference, um, the the skin the exterior skin that is usually on it got lost in shipping so they didn't have it so they just put it out here on the table like this um and this these are some of the mechanics inside of it um which is quite impressive but uh this is always kind of a terrifying image to me but you know um okay so here's here's one that's um kind of a a more of a toy robot. Um, it's kind of, we'll talk about toys specifically. Um, so there it's moving a little bit. So it's got actuated mouth and eyes. Make some, some expressions. Sorry, it was me. Ha, 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 ha. 
Here's a, another one. This one's kind of interesting. This is his best I think. Oh, he's... I think he doesn't want to... So you can see the screens for the eyes there. Yeah. And then kind of this weird clamshell face. Oh, he's stuck again. I got this on purpose. It's okay. This one is a, uh, a projected face um, for the robot, which gives you a little bit of flexibility um, in terms of, you know, if you want it to be a young face or an old face, um, and if you want to animate things a little bit better than how you can actually move things. Um, so that's another common technique. Um, oh, here's another one of those little clamshell robots. look at the base of it, you can see those Dynamixel actuators that everyone loves. All right, and so that brings me to a very important topic. Um, the clamshell looks depressed, yeah. Uh, I, the clamshell robot's quite interesting to program. I got to program it in a workshop. Um, it's weird. But toys. So what can we learn from toys? Um, so I mentioned toys. Um, previously uh, in class. And so this, these are, we, we take toys apart uh, quite a bit in our lab um, to see kind of, you know, how they work, um, the different techniques that are used. Because toys have to be pretty resilient um, because children are going to use them. They also have to be pretty safe um, and they have to be cheap, um, cheap enough to manufacture and sell for a profit. Um, and toys, are getting better and better um, and, and doing more and more cool things. Um, so taking apart toys is really interesting um, from a robotics perspective because, um, so if you think about something like, uh, you know, every joint you want to move, if you were to use a single motor for every joint, um, that starts to cost you quite a bit of money. But if you can come up with a clever mechanical trick to use one motor to move two joints, then, you know, you've saved a lot. Um, and you see that kind of scale up um, when you look at toys and toy design. Um, so here I'll show you this one um, in action. So this is uh, Hasbro uh, Joy for All. Um, it's a little dog robot, um, and you can see the um, the copper foil capacitive sensing um, that we've talked about before, um, and that's you know under the fur typically um, that detects touching. And so you can see when somebody touches it, you know it turns its head towards them, it moves its eyes, that kind of thing. Uh, here's the inside of one of these little fingerling uh, toy robots. And this is like a kind of like a really affordable, cheap, like couple dollar toy. Um, and it's got like a, a couple of little sensors in it. Um, it's got a little microcontroller in it, um, some batteries and a speaker. Um, but you can see, uh, you know, the engineering behind it um, and optimizing it to do um, what it needs to do. Here's another thing that's kind of interesting that came out of um, one of the uh, toy robots um, that we took apart. So for real robots, um, when we want to move a joint or something, um, you know, we have like this actuator and we're going to turn it, but we need to know if we actually moved where we think we moved. So we have sensors um, typically to tell us, you know, how much movement we've actually encountered. And we might use like a complicated, like an optical IR sensor or magnets and a Hall effect sensor uh, to get us really precise measurements. Um, but that's a little bit costly. So what toys tend to do is they use clever patterns um, here. Like you can see these circles that are cleverly made. Um, and then there's pieces of metal that will touch certain combinations of them when the toys you know, joint is in a certain configuration. Um, so that, that saves quite a bit of money in processing um, and is a really easy way to do that. Um, so now I want to switch 
um, away from from kind of the toys that I've torn apart and look more at some of these toys um, that are a little bit uh, more geared towards uh, being toys but also being programmable. Um, so we're going to talk about this. This is a Sphero RVR uh, robot and I will have uh, Kenna show you the app for it um, on this on the iPad uh, before we look at the actual robot. You're okay. Okay. So, um, this is, okay, yes. This is the block programming that Sphero uses. Um, so you can see we have like left and right headlight. Um, so we'll make it like flashing colors. Um, do you have, can you get the, Car. Yes. Sorry. Yes, I can <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you. Okay. So. Oh. So yeah, as you can see, <laughs> it's looping our program forever. Um, and they have a lot of like really cool sensing, like this is location, um, like how far the robot has traveled while it's doing whatever your program is. Um, and then they have a lot more complex things, different sensors. Uh, so, oh no. Um, <laughs> different ways for it to react to the world around it. Um, what else? <laughs> yeah, so, and like this is, you know, just a, a block programming language uh, here. Like kids can learn to do this. Um, you may have seen this before. Um, but, yeah, there we go. So, <laughs> also, you know, these things have full APIs, you know. Um, that you can write, uh, you know, JavaScript or Python or you know, whatever you want to write your own code um, for these robots. Um, and so Sphero is a company that's, you know, created a lot of them. Is it? Yeah. It's only during the program. Oh, so okay, that's a password. Yeah, okay. yeah sorry. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, they've got some great tools, though, um, that they've created uh, to, to make this easy. Um, and you know, really quick to do. And I should say these are pretty affordable as well. Um, I think this is like $120 or something maybe. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so they're, you know, they're not super cheap, but they're cheap enough. Um, so, you know, oh, it's blinking. Yeah, that's our program. All right, <laughs> good job. <laughs> Switch to Keynote. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're good. So let's kind of just getting us started transitioning from the world. Uh, let's see, like Mbot. Um, I don't know if I know Mbot. Do you know Mbot? No. I don't know. What is it? I'm not familiar with Mbot. M maybe not familiar. I'll give you this one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I might. We might have seen it. Um, <laughs> we see a lot of robots. Um, so I'll move on. Um, this is kind of an interesting robot too. So we're we're talking about toys, um, and yes, oh. just keep on. Okay. Uh, so this is a keep on robot, um, and it's uh, originally it was used um, for autism research. So it was a, originally a very expensive robot. Um, so you can see um, it it's kind of deformable. It's like this rubber. Um, and it moves kind of like in these weird directions and bounces up and down. Um, we would we would have it turned on, but it takes like eight AA batteries, and we're not we're not that competent today. Um, so it, it was sold as a toy. Um, the research version was you know used in a lot of studies with kids with autism, and it was really successful. And they actually converted it over to a toy, an affordable version um, that you know it dances to music, um, it responds to touching. Um, and it's really cool. They don't make them anymore. Um, 
but we bought a ton of them when they did make them. Um, so we've got lots of keep on <laughs> robots um, here. Um, here's one of the, the weirder studies that has been done in our lab with keep on. So in this, this project that was looking at um, adding eyebrow expressions to the keep on robot. Um, so they, they made it into a snowman, first of all, um, to hide the LEDs, but, and then did different uh, patterns um, with it, seeing if people could identify the emotions and, and kind of what impact that had. So even though keep on's a toy, um, they were nice enough. Uh, <laughs> TJ look alike. Um, yeah, a little top hat. Uh, we like to put little hats on our robots. Um, so the keep on toy can actually be uh, hacked and kind of programmed. Um, so this is showing the, the inside of it here. Um, and they actually put a little GitHub together with some documentation uh, to let you do that. Oh, OK, so the Mbot is a, a modular one. OK, oh, cool. yeah. That's cool. There are there are a lot of different modular ones that are out there, um, and those are really cool um, because yeah, you can just add blocks and stuff, um, physical blocks that do different things. Um, yeah. So, all right, keep on. I'll switch us over to Zerobot, um, and we can show you. So Zerobot is a a robot that um, we we started off with something that someone put out on the internet for us um, on Thingiverse, and we modified it heavily. Um, so we'll show you, a, here's just pieces of one. Um, kind of, you can see what's inside it here. Um, it's all 3D printed, um, with the exception of the motors. And um, what we've used um, for the processing is a Raspberry Pi, a little Pi Zero. Um, and we made a little battery drawer. And um, you can drive it around using a, an iPad app. Um, and so let me see, I have some, here's like some alternative versions of it. Um, uh, we have ones that use IR vision, ones that have headlights. Um, we've printed a ton of these. Um, and we, we ended up kind of uh, trying them out um, for um, law enforcement to use because they're so cheap to make that it doesn't matter if they lose them. Um, a very disposable robot that can kind of uh, it can be thrown into an environment and you know look around using a camera and get a remote feed. Um, so it's helpful uh, so that to get situational awareness. So as we move away kind of from toys and things that we we're just making, um, I want to talk about now. Um, so this is a really popular robot um, that you've probably seen. Uh, oh. There he is. Um, so he's a little little humanoid robot, um, and he can you know he can do things like walk around and talk and gesture, um, move his head. Oh, you want to show programming him? Um, yeah, just a second. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so and he's got a pretty. Hello, computer interaction class. It is nice to meet you all. <laughs> So yes. Um, so now is not a not a robot that um, you know we physically made. He's one that's sold, um, and he um, he's got lots of uh, programmable options. There he is, a little bit closer. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's full programming environments for him. He's used in like um, little soccer leagues, robot soccer leagues. You'll see some now robots trying to run around um, and play soccer. Um, and do you want to show a programming environment? Oh, yeah, we can do that. So sure. We'll show you the uh, programming environment. That's, so it's, got, it's also got a graphical uh, programming environment that you can use to kind of easily um, you drag these blocks, so this is it just saying something, for example. So you can view its sensors. Uh, that's what now is seeing right now. <laughs> um, and so it's pretty easy to, to prototype some basic things using just th this software. Um, but I should say, you know, there's full support for you know, using programming languages and actually uh, designing whatever it is you want uh, this robot to do. And so we use this robot in research quite a bit. It's a very reliable platform um, compared to a lot of options. Um, but it's also a, uh, a somewhat expensive um, 
platform. So I think I think now cost about eight thousand um, dollars for for one today. Um, so you want to play that behavior? Oh, I don't know. Is what it it'll do. Behavior? Um, it's probably fine. It'll oh, okay. It'll work. Okay, we'll see if it'll play. Yeah, <laughs> I just yeah play. should be fine. Oh yeah, he's standing up. <laughs> Hello, human computer interaction class. <laughs> it's nice to meet you all. <laughs> all right, good job, now. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> so that's now. Um, there's a picture of now using a computer. He's a little bit short, but. <laughs> so, oh, and if you want to see what's inside now's head. Um, <laughs> I've taken one apart, and uh, they actually put the computer, um, the single board computer, in the head of now. Um, so when you upgrade now, you just take his head off, and you send his head to the company, and they send you a new head. So what all can can now do? Um, now can do <laughs> a lot of things. Um, so he's got like 22 or 24 uh, degrees of freedom, different joints that can move. So he can walk, he can stand. Um, He's got his arms that can move. Um, he's only got what, three fingers. Um, yeah. yeah. Three fingers, but he can grasp things, you know, sort of with those. Um, and the like the LED lights, you can, you know, program to blink um, or do whatever you want them to do. He's got lots of sensors, so like touch sensors. He knows kind of what's going on. Um, bump sensors if you push something. He's got two cameras in his head, um, so he can track faces. Um, can track a, a little fake soccer ball around, chase it. Um, so all kinds of things. It's kind of just a general humanoid platform. Um, you know, he's a, he's a smaller robot, um, but has a lot of uh, expressive ability. And that's, that's what we like about him. So related to now um, is now's, um, I guess, sibling? I don't know. Um, so this is Pepper. Um, this is a robot that is made by the same company that makes now. Um, and so it's obviously larger um, and has the ability to move around. Um, it uses an omnidirectional drive system. It's looking at me right now. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of doing autonomous things right now. So it's not, uh, not being super helpful. But there we go. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so it's it is a lot like now. It's bigger, it's got wheels uh, to move it around, and it's got this tablet mounted to its chest. Um, so we've seen people uh, using this, deploying this in, um, you know, like shopping malls, airports, um, retail scenarios, things like that. Um, there we go. Playing football. Ah, it's playing football, okay. <laughs> So <laughs> can do all kinds of stuff. Um, we, we have the, the speech um, disabled right now because she's, she's very chatty. She will try to start conversations and interrupt constantly. Um, so um, can these robots walk? Uh, so these, yeah, these have wheels. Uh, the, the Pepper robot here, um, it's got an omnidirectional drive system. So it's three um, kind of ball-like wheels. So it can actually move in any direction um, and rotate in place. Um, whereas the, the smaller, you know, the now robot has just, just legs um, and, and tries to walk. Um, so, let me, she. Um, no, I mean, I tried to get her to walk to move forward, but you know, it hurt oh. things up. Oh, yeah, so okay. She doesn't run away. She has a lot of safety features, <laughs> um, and we've sometimes it, they have to be overridden and carefully monitored to make her do things. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it, can, it can do quite a bit. Um, okay, so let's see. Oh, yes, and I should mention um, that uh, Pepper is. Um, also, you know, can use the same system that now can use um, to be programmed. Um, so the same 
you know, visual interface. Um, there, they just give you a picture of like the back of her head. Um, so there's an Ethernet port in there. It's useful sometimes. Um, <laughs> and a lot of fans. Um, so kind of the same design, just a, a bigger robot. So let's move on to the creepy robots. Um, the, this is what we call the creepy robots. Their, their actual name is the, the Robokind R25 robot. Um, so we have male and female versions of these robots. Um, and kind of the, the novelty here is that they have expressive faces. So we'll see if we can get this one to emote mm -hmm. a little bit. <laughs> scared. Oh, mm. scared. Okay. Uh, in denial. <laughs> and excited. <laughs> so, these robots um, are are quite interesting. Um, they're they're really nice because you can do the facial expressions, and you've got some degrees of freedom there. Um, they're not uh, the most joyful thing to program and interface with. Um, the company that makes them has kind of moved on to selling them as a an end user product for schools to use, um, particularly with um, autistic students. Um, and so they, uh, they don't really support um, researchers programming them too much anymore. Um, so we, we have a constant battle to be able to uh, write software for these things still. Um, but we do use them in our studies. Um, and, and they're kind of interesting because they have faces. These don't walk. Um, they have rollers on their, under their feet. Um, and they kind of like lift up and then roll themselves <laughs> across the ground. Um, so a little bit different there. Um, and of course, they have the screen on them, which is kind of convenient. Um, so here's uh, the male version of it, reading an iPad. Um, so it's kind of nice to have those degrees of uh, freedom so that you can do things like you know make its eyes move and, and look like it's reading. Um, here's, um, oh, here's a clip of, of it um, doing some extreme engagement. Let's see. This is a home and school. Does that sound okay to you? <laughs> so uh, that's uh, can it actually read aloud? Uh, yeah, you can. You, we can program it to make it look like it's reading out loud. Uh, it, you know, it's not actually looking at the text on the iPad. It does have a camera in its chest, um, but but yeah, um, you know, it can speak. Um, so, and, and this video was us, you know, developing um, different levels of e expressivity um, and, and different uh, synchronizations between the lip movement and the, the voice. Um, yeah, the, the now looking at him is interesting. So it's, it's funny because uh, like the now robot tracks human faces, but it thinks that the, uh, the creepy robot, you know, because it has a face, it thinks that's a human and it will stare at it um, and track it around. Um, and if that wasn't creepy enough, let me show you what one looks like inside. Um, so here I've removed the hair from, from the female Robokind robot. Um, so this is what's inside of its head. You've got some uh, PCBs for the different motors. Um, it's actually pretty complicated um, to get those uh, facial movements um, and to get all of those motors packed into such a small area. Um, Here's a picture of, of kind of the full um, back of the head removed there. Um, and you can see uh, that there's quite a bit uh, involved in, in the face movements um, themselves. And then there's the front of it um, just showing the, the front panel taken off. Um, you can see the copper strips there. Um, there's six microphones um, to help it uh, localize speech. Um, and you can see the copper there too. So those touch sensors, very common. Um, even in these robots. All right, so that brings us to Therabot. Um, so Therabot is a robot that um, I've mentioned quite a few times um, because too much of my time is spent um, with Therabot. Um, so 
we've got Therabot plugged in right now, so I'll switch to, to the video. So you can see on the table, um, uh, and um, so it's tethered right now because I don't have the battery in it, and I didn't put any of the fur on it because I wanted you to see the beautiful inside of it. Um, we'll unplug it in a second and, and bring it closer. Um, but we can show you one of the interfaces. Um, so let me switch to that. So um, this is one interface that we use. Um, this is a full kind of diagnostic interface um, for Therabot. Um, that controls um, kind of all of its behaviors and, and lets us do a lot of diagnostic work, um, kind of telling us about all of the motors um, and, and its status. Um, we can tell it to start making movements um, and, and then that will you know, allow it to, to start moving um, or allow sounds. Um, it's got a transducer in it that lets it kind of have a heartbeat feel to it. Um, I'm going to try with the tag. Let's see if it'll. Oh, yeah. Let's we'll see if we can get it to start actuating a little bit. Oh, OK. Um. So you'll see it's just going to kind of do some aliveness behavior here. And it's really small uh, movements. When it's in its uh, full costume, you, you kind of you see a much bigger uh, moving target. But you can see like it's wagging its tail. Some of its head poses. So the way that we um, design uh, the different movements is that we, um, we typically do it in terms of keyframes, kind of like animations, um, animating different poses and movements between them. If you're good. So that's kind of just some of its uh, movements. Um, we can go ahead and shut it down, I guess, and then we can bring it a little bit closer since it's all plugged in right now. So just so you can get an idea. kind of Therabot. <laughs> so it's a pretty, um, pretty complicated um, robot in terms of it has quite a few actuators. Um, it's got a lot of you know, different sensors in it. Um, you get to watch well-meaning skeletons. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's, that is an accurate description of this, of, uh, this lecture. Um, <laughs> So it's got a different degrees of freedom, um, and it's still got to be um, somewhat, you know, uh, nice to hold um, when it's a stuffed animal. Um, so it's got quite a bit of, uh, yeah. Here's what it actually <laughs> looks like when it's all covered up. Um, quite a bit of padding inside of it um, that's used uh, to make it soft. And uh, even though it looks like quite a complicated uh, mechanical structure inside of it and, and quite a bit of electronics. It is actually a very um, nice uh, robot to hold. It's not, it doesn't feel like hard plastic or anything. Um, it's got a lot of compliance, so if you move, it will, you know, accommodate you. Um, and, uh, oh, I should say the hang tag. Um, so we use a little, a little interface. Um, it's got a screen and some buttons um, so that you can quickly, you know, ask it to do something without needing to pull up an actual app or an interface or anything like that. So that is Therabot. And I think that pretty much um, sums up everything that we have to look at today. Um, so in terms of Action items, uh, here's everything um, that we've got going on. Um, we're here, robots in making, we just finished that. You've got all of these things that will be due on Monday. Um, and then your project and your exam will be due um, on that day of our final before midnight. Um, and we will, uh, next time we meet, we'll meet on Thursday. That'll be our last class meeting. Um, we'll do AR and VR and kind of wrap things up for the semester.
Um, but other than that, um, that's everything that I've got today. Um, we'll meet on Thursday for AR and VR um, on WebEx. And if you need anything or have any questions about your projects, um, please let me know. Um, otherwise, have a great day.